I'm Phil Ponce. Thanks for joining us on this Monday, November 18th. Coming up on Chicago tonight, how is the Chicago Police Department doing on implementing reforms? The story of Chicago's rise as a Polish-American hub, plus gems, rocks, minerals, and more, all at a local museum. First tonight, a vacancy is opening for one of the top posts in Illinois politics. Who is going to fill it? Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here with the latest. Amanda. Phil, even lawmakers and those who are close to Senate President John Cullerton say they were bowled over that he is going to be retiring from state politics. Now, he is not gone yet, but the Senate president is planning to leave his post at an unspecified date in January. He's leaving at what could be considered the height of his power, his party holding a super majority in the Illinois House, Democrats also controlling the governor's mansion, and in the Senate, a super majority. More than double the number of Democratic senators there than there are Republicans which is to say that Democrats have the sheer numbers to do whatever they want policy-wise. Cullerton also, though, leaving while the FBI clearly has a sharp eye on corruption in Springfield. Cullerton's spokesman says the president is adamant he personally is not under federal investigation. He's keeping a promise to his wife that he will spend more time with his family. And uh, so who decides who will get his job once he decides to leave sometime in January? The full Senate votes here. As I said, Democrats outnumber Republicans more than two to one. So really, it's up to those Senate Democrats. And more than likely, they will meet in private in early January to choose their new caucus leader. And then the next day, the full Senate will convene, hold a formal session in the Capitol and make it official. So who's in the running, Amanda? This isn't like a regular campaign where, you know, petitions have to be signed and they file paperwork with the State Board of Elections. Also, several senators that I spoke with say that with not even a week having passed since this news about Cullerton retiring, that it's too early to announce even an informal bid and to get campaigning. But I have spent the whole day on calls to get a hold of how this race is shaping up. Two of the legislators thought to be main contenders are not going for it after all. Neither Senator Andy Menar, he's from downstate, nor Senator Heather Staines of Chicago will jockey for the job. Instead, they are both backing another colleague. That's Kim Lightford of Maywood. She was first elected to the Senate in 1998, and Lightford was key in increasing the minimum wage. She has also been heavily involved in education policy. Lightford herself has not responded to my multiple requests for comment. She would, though, and this is something that Staines and Menard say is significant, be the General Assembly's first black woman to be in that powerful position of holding a, being a legislative leader. Now, having that open support of Staines and Menard is certainly a huge boost for her chances at the presidency. But she does not have the job wrapped up. Several other senators are also interested at this point. They say they're talking to colleagues and, again, not making formal announcements. Among them, Senators Don Harmon of Oak Park, Mike Hastings of Tinley Park and LG Sims Jr. of Chicago. I talked with each of them. They say they're making calls, learning what changes their colleagues want to see in Springfield. It is difficult to gauge just how this is all going to shake out because these are private conversations. Several lawmakers, insiders that we haven't mentioned yet, they say they predict the race is going to come down to being between Harmon and Lightford, but Really, or, yeah, but really, who knows? Uh, other names pop up as well? That is true. Other names, Senators Melinda Bush, also Tony, Mo Tony Munoz. Neither of them returned my calls either, so it is early. Senators will likely vote in early January, so there are going to be a lot of talks leading up into then. And then, Phil, whoever gets this job has a big task ahead of them. They will have to try and help to pass a state budget when, of course, as we know, times are lean in Illinois, not a lot of money to work with. And then they're also going to have to deal with this ethical cloud that hangs over Springfield and then fundraise money so that Democrats, at least this is their goal, of course, to hold on to that supermajority in the Senate. Amanda, thank you. Mm -hmm. And out of Carol Moraine and a new report's findings on the Chicago Police Department. Carol. 
Phil, an independent federal monitor tasked with overseeing the reform of the Chicago Police Department says CPD is already falling behind on its efforts. On Friday, the monitoring team released its first report on the police department's progress and revealed it had missed 37 of 50 agreed upon deadlines for preliminary compliance. Mayor Lori Lightfoot said earlier today that she expects the next monitoring report due in another six months will reflect better progress. But are the missed deadlines just growing pains as the process of reform begins, or are they a sign of just how difficult changing the department is going to be? Joining us to share their insights, Karen Sheely. She's a lawyer and director of the Police Practices Project at the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois, where she's responsible for enforcing the ACLU's agreement with the city and the police department regarding the stop and frisk policy. And Reverend Saeed Richardson, Director of Policy at the Community Renewal Society, a faith-based organization that's involved with the coalition pushing for police reform. Welcome back, both of you, to Chicago tonight. So, Ms. Sheely, let me start with you. Missing 37 of 50 deadlines, is that as bad as it sounds? It's worrisome to us because some of the deadlines that they missed are really critical to the foundation of the reform process. So for example, they ha don't have a policy yet on investigating officers when there's a shooting or when officers kill someone. And they haven't set a policy on uh, wh how police officers should respond when people are videotaping. So these aren't sideline policies. These are, are some of the core pieces of the decree and the reason that we have the decree in the first place. And so your key, if there is one takeaway that jumps out at you above all else, what is it? I'm going to steal and take three. The first is that um, they're, they're not just met missing deadlines, but the monitor has said that uh, community participation in the decree is, and the manner that CPD is going about it, is really disenfranchising the community. They need to change the way that they're doing interactions and the way that they're gathering information when they're implementing policies. The second is that a lot of these policies are key to the decree, so we're not just missing um, sideline policies. And then the third is the monitor identified that that the department needs more resources in a number of areas in order to achieve the reforms. So she's identifying that they need more people working on writing policies, on training, on crisis intervention, and on the review of use of force. Reverend Richardson, so Lori Lightfoot, as you heard today, said, well, it will be better in the next monitoring report. And CPD, as, as I read the report, says, well, they were in the process of finishing their work on some of these benchmarks, but weren't quite there yet. Um, do you, is that persuasive for you? Um, not very at all. Um, I think the reality is that we believe that the police really need to take seriously the concerns that are lifted in this report. Um, Chicago has a history of policing, um, that it's a decades-long problem that's, in, that's been in need of resolution and fixing for a mighty long time. And if anything, uh, the fact that there are so many violations of timelines bring to the reality that for too long there's been a need for change. Um, and so when police are moving forward, they have to take seriously these concerns from everything from their training all the way up to how um, police are, are, are evaluated to how, um, uh, uh, how they move, and uh, whether they're in the street, whether they're in their cars, whether they're engaged full um, in and outside of their uh, the work. And let me add here that we invited the Chicago Police Department and uh, we invited the Chicago Police Union to come on. Uh, neither accepted our invitation. We would have loved to have them join you. So what of the things that CPD has done uh, would you judge Ms. Sheely to be significant or encouraging? I, I think it's a good thing that they're in this process. I, the consent decree is the first time um, in the history of all the failed attempts at reform that the reform efforts are going to be overseen by a federal judge, that um, if they get behind on their, their deadlines, they're going to have to meet them. And the fact that we're in this process... There's no wiggle room, in other words. Right. <clears throat> um, and I'm not so concerned about the total number of missed deadlines. I'm, my larger concern is that we haven't heard a plan from the department about how they're going to catch up. Because looking ahead in the next six months, the department has another 60 deadlines that are going to be evaluated. So it's not a question... So wait, of, let me do the math here, then. If they missed already 37... They have 60 more, we're up to 97 
deadlines that need to be met, is that correct, in the next six months. And I'd rather see them get it right than do it fast, but if they're going to take more time to try to accomplish these deadlines, they need to be transparent with the people who are affected and they need to be transparent with the court. So we need to see a plan about how they're going to get it done and when they're going to meet these deadlines. So Robert Richardson, one of the big stopping parts of this, back to Rahm Emanuel, was community engagement. Mm -hmm. There seemed to be some reluctance in that administration to, to finally build in that final, most uh, significant plank of getting the community involved. Where's that process? What are you seeing or hearing with CPD and the community? Well, the reality, as the Independent Monitors Report lets up for us, um, is that they're missing that mark very, very, very boldly. Um, Historically, Chicago police have had a Chicago police-centered, police-first methodology of assessing problems and then making solutions. We're arguing that it needs to be a community-centered, a community-first approach that they haven't done before. And what that means is that you need to come into this space, you need to engage community members, you need to listen to what they have to say, also accept the fact that you're a police officer coming into this space and your very presence might bring trauma and pain with it. Um, I'm an African-American male, I'm middle age, um, and even I, uh, when, when I approach a police officer, my, my heart rate increases, my blood pressure increases, um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. People have much more traumatic experiences that they've experienced. Um, and so when police come into a space, they, ha they have to recognize that their very presence is bringing pain with it. But even in the midst of that, even in the midst of coming in and engaging <clears throat> uh, the, the problematic overtones of their, their presence, they have to be able to listen to folks, they have to be able to take seriously the concerns that people bring to them, um, they have to lay down the defensiveness and be humble to be able to take and receive that. And when they receive that data, take it back, process it, return information and feedback <clears throat> upon what they had. If they choose not to do something, even communicate that back to the, to the communities that they've gotten information from. And then lastly, when they're going through the process of actually making change, measurably, measurably report back systematically over and over again, let folks know that they're continually working out the things that folks have given input for. It's well, not happening. We need more of that. One of the things that jumped out at me, and, and I don't know if it jumped out at you, is that the report says there are a hundred different data systems in the police department. I know as a reporter filing uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, there are all sorts of different repositories for that data. How does the police department comply when it doesn't have its systems talking to each other so you can find one report through that whole portal. That's a, a, a piece that stood out to me too, because as someone has FOIA'd and sued the police department, it's very difficult to track down information. And part of what that tells us is that internally, they're gonna have a difficult time even communicating with each other, let alone the monitor. Another piece of the report that stands out is that the monitor and her team, who we're paying for as citizens, um, have a lot of expertise that they want to bring to the policy development and to the reform of the department. And much like with, with being kind of held back in terms of community input, they've been um, pushing the monitor aside until they get most of the policies developed too. We really want to see that change in the next six months. The report says they may need more resources. This is the city of Chicago which is bleeding red ink as well as you know some of our youth on the streets of Chicago where where do you get the money to do more than they're currently doing I mean what what's the solution to that well we have to do it we're paying so much in police misconduct cases that if we don't invest in this reform effort then it, it, it we're going to be staring down um, more hundreds of thousands of dollars in police misconduct compounded on the fact that every one of those dollars represents the pain that somebody went through. We're in need of a cultural change. <clears throat> We're in need of a, a cultural change, the way in which police engage and see people. Um, and again, whether they're driving in a car, whether they see somebody on the side of the road, whether they're in a public forum, whether they're in a private space, um, that's what we're trying to get to. And ultimately, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem that has to be taken seriously. It's a problem that has to be engaged with a lot of work, energy, and effort. Um, and it's something that we can't avoid from. Are you optimistic, either of you, that um, this is going to turn out well and, and turn itself around, Reverend? I am. <laughs> I'm a person of faith. And so at the end of the day, um, optimism and hope uh, uh, reigns through my blood. Um, but I'm also a black man um, who lives and works in the, uh, um, in the Chicagoland area. And I've seen and I've witnessed so very much. I've got two children um, as well. Um, and so the reality for me is that in order to achieve that cultural change that we're trying to reach for, 
um, it's going to take a lot of energy and effort um, and a lot of change. Ms. Sheely, in a word, yes, no? It's the best shot we've got for reform in Chicago because the consent decree is overseen by a federal judge. So I I'm bound to be optimistic, yes. Karen Sheely, Saeed Richardson, thank you very much for being with thank us in Chicago tonight. More ahead, stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. City Council is getting closer to voting on the mayor's proposed budget. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. And Phil Mayor Lori Lightfoot says the budget is in, quote, good shape heading into a vote next week. Lightfoot says some amendments and changes have been suggested since she introduced it. But this week, her office is in touch with members of city council to remind folks of what's in the budget and how they plan to bridge that massive $838 million budget gap. We've done it through making sure that we are looking at a number of different efficiencies. We've made some uh, additional cuts um, in um, personnel, but no, I feel very comfortable that, you know, what we talked about before is the, the only property tax increase, which is a small increase in the library levy in order to facilitate <coughs> the opening of uh, on Sunday hours. You will not see in this budget a large property tax increase. And it may not be beach going weather for a while, but residents who live near several Chicago beaches will notice a lot more activity. The Chicago Department of Transportation and the Park District are working to stop further damage and erosion caused by waves and storms at area beaches. And the Army Corps of Engineers predicts lake levels will remain high through the winter and next spring due to increased precipitation. Crews will start working at Juneway Beach in Rogers Park, then Rogers and Howard Beaches, laying loose stones called riprap to form a foundation. The agencies are doing similar work at 49th Street and the lakefront and installing barriers at 67th to protect South Shore Drive from storm-related flooding. As for the weather, tonight cloudy with a low around 34, then tomorrow morning rains, then cloudy with a high near 41. Now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Brandis. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, a new rule for doctors and hospitals to tell you the costs of tests or non-emergency procedures, but could the rule actually wind up raising prices? A ProPublica reporter who confronted the legacy of racism in her story about so-called sundown towns. Carved gemstones and more at a rededicated local museum. A local historian charts the rise of Chicago as a Polish-American magnet. And Chicago's Hebrew Brantley created art for some of Hollywood's biggest names. Now he's bringing some of that work back home. But for some of today's top business headlines, and here's Crane Chicago business editor Ann Dwyer. Phil, Cranes reports that Mayor Lori Lightfoot is dismantling one of her predecessor's most ballyhooed initiatives, namely Rahm Emanuel's Chicago Infrastructure Trust. The trust was first rolled out in 2012, promising to transform Chicago with mega projects so enticing that they could be bankrolled entirely by private investors in exchange for a chunk of the profits. Among the trust's big projects were the installation of 4G on CTA trains, retrofitting city buildings for energy efficiency, and replacing street lights with LED bulbs. But the program never really caught fire, and as a result, Lightfoot is following through on a campaign promise to wind it down. Meanwhile, Boeing was hit today with a lawsuit seeking to hold company board members accountable for the lapses of oversight that contributed to two fatal crashes. As Bloomberg reports, the lawsuit alleges directors missed repeated red flags while developing the 737 MAX automated flight control systems and then waited months to investigate the design flaws in the first of the two accidents. The suit also charges that in its rush to get the 737 MAX to market, the Chicago-based plane maker didn't properly test the new system or adequately train pilots. And finally, Pork and Mindy's is no more. The barbecue joint has filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. The chain, which debuted in Bucktown in January 2016 and then expanded to locations in Wrigley Field and The Loop, 
has shut its doors. The news comes just months after its owner, celebrity chef and Chicago native Jeff Morrow, inked a deal with the Mariano's grocery chain to open 20 stores by the end of the year. A few were up and running before the bankruptcy filing. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann Dwyer. Back to you, Phil. Thank you, Ann. The Trump administration is proposing a new health care price transparency rule. It would basically force hospitals to explain how much a medical service would cost up front before a patient receives treatment. Your insurance plan would also have to tell you how much it would pay and how much you would owe, again, before the service is performed. Joining us now to tell us more is Anthony Lasasso. He's professor and Driehaus fellow at DePaul University. He's an economist focusing on health policy and health services and outcomes. Uh, Tony Lasasso, welcome back to Chicago tonight. First of all, explain what the new rule would do. So the new rule really has three pieces to it. Um, I'll, I'll talk about them briefly, but the first one is that health insurers uh, have to provide a tool that will allow their enrollees to learn about health care costs uh, for potential services that they may receive. Um, this is not emergency. This, this is, is stuff. This would be something that you have some time to perhaps deliberate over. You know, maybe maybe a hernia repair, maybe knee, shoulder. You know, not obviously from the back of an ambulance. You, you would right. think. Uh, but, but, but now I'll just point out on that, insurers are already doing this. We probably, you and I sitting here probably have access to a tool that lets us look up health care costs in our plan. Um, the problem is nobody uses them. We probably don't use them. I don't use it. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you do, but I, I don't. don't. Yeah, it's, it's there. Um, they're doing it. The, the, the second item, I think, is the one that actually is causing um, most of the concern, I think, in both the provider community and maybe the health insurance industry, and that's that the health insurers are supposed to publish lists of all of the contract prices for health care services. That they, these are negotiated prices, not the charges, which are these wildly inflated numbers that uh, health care providers charge for services. These are the negotiated rates at which they will accept reimbursement from insurers. Um, the third piece has to do with, so I wouldn't come back to that, but the third piece has to do with um, basically allowing insurers to create new types of plans that would create shared savings incentives uh, that, that would uh, perhaps create meaningful incentives for insurers to want to push uh, their enrollees towards cheaper health care providers. But the nub of the uh, rule, as I understand it, is that it would be a consumer-friendly way of comparing costs yeah. so that if you wanted to get a re uh, knee replacement at Northwestern, yeah. you could compare what it would cost you at, uh, at Swedish Covenant, at uh, Lutheran General, and so forth. Uh, is, is that what this rule would uh, do? Th th that, that is what the rule aspires to do, to try to create... Um, uh, basically, I mean, as the name implies, healthcare transparency with respect to prices. Why is that uh, not a good thing? That is a very good thing, uh, I, I think. You know, uh, prices are what motivate behavior uh, in just about every other, every other aspect of our lives. Uh, healthcare is a little more complicated, though, for a number of reasons. I mean, first is that, well, we have third-party payment. We have insurers. We have... Uh, uh, you know, we don't we don't see the full price of care. We often don't need to care about the full price of health care because uh, because it's covered. Um, now that that's been changing in recent years because deductibles have been going up uh, in the last you know decade or so. Uh, that's the amount that you have to pay out of pocket before your insurance kicks in. So so consumers, enrollees, patients have more skin in the game now. Uh, so, so this could have some meaningful effects. Because um, typically, if one knows what the price is, if you're uh, shopping for a new car, you might get three different quotes, and you decide, okay, I'm going to go with the, yep. I'm going to go with the cheapest option. Wouldn't this work to bring prices down? It, it, it I think that the short answer is maybe. <laughs> so, I would say that um, there's a lot of there's a lot of forces in healthcare that uh, actually kind of conspire, not necessarily overtly, but conspire to kind of work against that, that aim. Um, and some of it is just simply practical that, you know, you may have a great deal of incentive to uh, stay, stay with what your provider recommends. If your provider says, go see so-and-so for your, for your MRI, um, 
you're inclined to go see that, that physician. And can I give you a personal example? Please. My physician recently t asked me to get a calcium heart scan. He said, you can get it at the hospital that where I'm attending. Yeah. It'll cost you about 400 There's another hospital where the identical tests, 150 yep. I went online and I found one that did it for $49, <laughs> and that's the one I went to. Exact same test. Why isn't that good information? So, no, that, that's, uh, that's undeniably good information. Standard procedure, absolutely. Um, you've got skin in the game. You're being an informed consumer. All I'm telling you is that these tools already exist, and we're not using them. Uh, again, I, I don't know why there's not, uh, you know, provider organizations here, uh, you know, to... to to talk talk with us about well, this because they're opposed to it. They're they, opposed. To, they, why they are the hospitals it. and why are the insurance companies uh, opposed to this? I I think the main thing is the second part uh, of the rule, the the publishing lists in a in a uh, machine read. This is in the machine readable format. So you know I'm a healthcare economist. I I study this stuff for a living. I'm frankly quite excited about the prospects of getting my hands on that machine readable data, so I can look and see what's actually being. Uh, what is the transaction price for a lot of healthcare services? And showing and looking at uh, how much variation there is, even within a city, even maybe across the street, even you know examples of you know that like the one you just provided. Uh, there's a huge amount of variation out there, but but it's sort of invisible. We don't have much of an incentive. There's not a culture in the healthcare system where we even think like consumers. You Although know, one of the things the rule requires, and we're almost out of time, is that this information be presented in a consumer-friendly way. I would imagine that would be key. Yeah, and I'm telling you, it's already there. They're doing it in a consumer-friendly way. In, in consumer, they, health insurers have very slick tools um, that we're not using. They're out there. Uh, I, I, I think that you know everybody should take a look. Everybody who should, out there should take a look at their uh, uh, their their web their insurer's website. See what sort of tools they have at their disposal now already. Tony Lasasso, thank you so much for joining us. By the way, this new rule is uh, is a proposed rule. There's a year's worth of public commentary before it would go into effect. And up next, a look at the history of a racist practice called sundown towns in Illinois and elsewhere. So stay with us. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Sundown Town is a term many people might not be familiar with, but it's one that's known to many African Americans. These were places across the United States, towns, villages, and so forth, where black Americans knew they weren't welcome, especially after dark. A new ProPublica Illinois story examines the legacy of one sundown town in southern Illinois, a town called Anna, A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Joining us is ProPublica Illinois reporter Logan Jaffe. Logan Jaffe, welcome to Chicago tonight. And for people who aren't familiar with the term, more on what a sundown town is. Sure, a sundown town is any community in the entire United States that at some point in their history had a policy or practice that excluded black people from living there and particularly from being there after dark. And uh, your, your interest was uh, sparked by a book. Tell us, uh, uh, tell us about that book. Yeah, so the book is aptly titled Sundown Towns and it was published in 2005 by um, a guy named Dr. James Lowen and he is from Decatur, Illinois. And he did a, his book details this sweeping history of sundown towns all around the country. But when he started researching in Illinois, he thought he would find just a couple and instead, he found evidence of hundreds of them in our state. And you focus primarily on the town of Anna, Illinois. And tell us why you decided to uh, zoom in on Anna. Well, other than that, so it was actually the first town that is written about in the Sundown Town book. And it was written about because there is this legend and this lore surrounding the town name of Anna. And the legend is, is that Anna stands for Ain't No N Words Allowed. And I was in the area. I was actually working on a different project so in Carbondale. It's an acronym. It's, an, it's a, a, for a racist term. 
Precisely. How, and, and you write about how you came to know about this acronym. Tell us what the circumstance was. Well, I had read about it in a book, in the Sundown Towns book, but when I went to Anna, and I, you know, my plan was to stay there for a day or two and just kind of poke around, I went and got dinner at a bar there and got into a conversation, as one does. I'm a reporter, I'm a curious person, and said to the guy next to me, hey, so tell me about this town. And the first thing he said was, well, you know how this town is called Anna. That stands for ain't no n-words allowed. And that kind of prompted more investigating for me. And you write in your article, following up on, on your uh, this update on the town of Anna, the, describe the way he said it, how self-conscious he was, what the, you know, what other people around. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, um, you know, so part of me was not expecting to hear this at all. I was assuming, you know, this happened, maybe this was in the past, I was not expecting to hear this right away. But when he said that, um, you know, he didn't quite look around the room. He just looked me right in the eye and said it as if you would say anything. Like, hey, this town was founded in 1854. Hey, this town is known as ANNA. And for me... So there was no self-consciousness about it on his part? Not that I detected hmm. at that moment at all. So you spent uh, two years working on this project. Yes. And so how did you go about reporting it? For example, how, how did you interact with people? Yeah, I mean, I just kind of, at first I was just trying to talk to as many different people in Anna as I could. Because still, for the first two times that I was there, and I went about four or five times over the course of two years, I was just trying to gut check, is this a thing? How many people know about this? And do people understand why? Like, what actually happened here? What is the story? Was there anybody in Anna who did not know what the uh, acronym stood for? I met one person. You met one person who had not heard. And that's probably, you know, 40, 40 50 people. I, 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 I don't, it's hard to keep, keep track of because I would, you know, I would stand outside of the Walmart. I would stand outside of the convenience store. I went to the library. I talked with um, public officials. I went to the historical society. And there was not, there was one single person, but we're not going to get into that All right. story. So, so how open were, were locals? How open were locals about talking about their past, uh, explaining this acronym, or uh, coming to terms with it? Yeah, well, most people who I, who I met had heard of it at some point in their life, either from their parents or a grandparent or as a joke, and had heard of it, um, and were actually just as curious as I was, for, for the most part, to try to better understand what actually happens, because people had heard different rumors or you know, kind of these origin myths. But the more I talked to people, the more I realized that there was a curiosity about this, this, this acronym and why. So that's when I started doing the more historical research. And uh, speaking of historical research, you include a startling photo of a 1909 lynching in Anna that was witnessed by thousands uh, of people and it and, and uh, also, you, you highlight how much of Southern Illinois sympathi sympathized with the South before and after the Civil War. Tell us more about this picture. Sure. So I want to be clear. So the photo is in Cairo. Close um, to Anna. Very close to Anna. So it's about 35 miles south of Anna. Um, at the, but the story behind this particular photo is a couple days before that, there was a young white woman who was from Anna, and her name was coincidentally Anna. She was found murdered in the alley. This was in 1909. And a couple days later, a black man named, named William James was accused of her murder without trial. Uh, and, you know, word spread about his arrest. Thousands of people uh, reported uh, the Cairo Bulletin at the time, the newspaper in Cairo at the time, showed up. And he was lynched in the middle of the commercial district. In, in Cairo. Cairo. In, in Cairo. In Cairo. Correct. Um, but it but did affect Anna, in, the town of Anna. And how did it affect the town of Anna? So... And I believe it was the night after William James was lynched in, in Cairo, a band of Anna men, so a small mob of Anna men got together and there were um, about 10, according to the different newspapers at the time, 10 black men who worked at a rock quarry in Anna. And they band together and ran those black workers out of town and according to the newspapers, they did not return. You talked to black residents living there because there are 
a few black residents, what did they say their lives were like? Well, a very few. And by few, you know, it's hard to put an exact number on it, but there is one particular family that moved to Anna from Murfreesboro, which is about 25 miles north of Anna, in 2016. Why would I they believe. move to uh, a town that has a reputation as being a sundown town? Well, um, the mother, whose name is Easter Smith, she wanted to give it a shot. She was in a difficult situation in Murfreesboro, and it had really good. She had positive experiences through her um, her son, her oldest son, Arie, had some friends in the community, and honestly, they found a place to live there. You write that uh, things worked out well for the son. He achieved some success as an athlete, but that the black family there felt a pressure to be on their very best behavior. Sure. And I, you know, I think that Easter story is not necessarily unique in the way that is so separate from the experience of many African Americans in, in predominantly white communities. I, um, you know, the, from Easter's perspective, you know, she sat her kids down around a table, she calls it a table talk um, before dinner, and they, uh, she warned her kids, hey, we are going to be on our best behavior here. We are going to give it, you know, our, we're going to come to this situation with a positive attitude. Um, but if somebody calls you the N-word, you're not to physically fight them. And take they were away. prepared. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're really out of time. But is there a takeaway from this? Know your history. You can't know if we're over the past unless you know what happened. Logan Jaffe, thank you so much for sharing uh, that bit of history with us. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. And we are back with more right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. Well, there's now more to explore at a local museum that really rocks. Rocks, minerals, and gemstones, that is. They share the spotlight at a remarkable showcase at Oak Brook. We visited this gem of a museum before it reopened to the public. Incredibly detailed carvings raw minerals that reward close inspection, even gemstone dioramas that recreate the natural world. All of these reside in the new home of the Lozadro Museum of Lapidary Art. In the United States, we are the only museum dedicated to lapidary art. Lapidary art is cutting and polishing stone and working with stone. So we have uh, many, what we call hard stone carvings, and that's uh, stones that cannot be cut with metal. So they're ground away with a harder stone. In order to do lapidary art, you have to know something about stone. So we also go into the science of rocks and minerals. The museum recently moved to Oak Brook after 57 years in Elmhurst, and it has nearly doubled in size. We visited on a day this family-run institution was open to friends and workers still readying the space for its grand reopening. One of the first things we noticed was a new item with a history. This five-foot-tall jade pagoda was displayed at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. The pagoda came from the Oakland uh, County Museum of California, and it was uh, donated to the museum along with uh, several other pieces from the chain collection. If you take a closer look, you will be uh, amazed by the exceptional techniques and the knowledge the lapidary artist exercised on this particular piece. Out of the thousands of minerals in the world, only a few hundred are considered gems. We have amber and coral and uh, ivory, really all of the organic gemstones. So that would be from once living plants or animals. Many of these works were carved by lapidary artists hundreds of years ago. Others come from the 21st century. Whether ancient or modern, the carvers shared a keen sense of imagination. If you think about a rough block of stone, and then they have to see the image that's going to come out of that stone, and it can take years and years of work to complete the pieces. So for example, just the pagoda alone took um, 10 years of work to complete the pagoda with over 150 craftsmen working on it full time. <laughs> The Reimagined Museum now has interactive displays and minerals from around the world, including uncanny eye-catching formations. It's a combination of nature, science, and artistry. There are snuff boxes, 
mosaics of thin layers of stone that look like paintings. And did we mention dioramas? The museum was founded in 1962 by Joseph Lazzadro, an Italian immigrant who collected stone carvings and made jewelry as a hobby. He made a fortune in the electrical contracting business, and when he died in 1972, he left an endowment to help support the museum. The current director is a gemologist and also the founder's granddaughter. As a family, we really care about the pieces. We want to maintain the collection and we want to share it with the public. And we want to educate the public about uh, rocks and minerals and gemstones. The Lozadro Museum of Lapidary Art reopened last week and you can find out more on our website. And out of Paris shots in the story of Chicago's rise as a Polish-American hub. Paris. The first wave of Polish immigration to Chicago was in the 1860s. Since then, Chicago has long been home to one of the largest Polish populations outside of Poland. Polish Americans have not only helped shape the city, but they've also helped influence the political development of Poland itself. A local historian tells that story in a new book called American Warsaw, The Rise, Fall and Rebirth of Polish Chicago. And joining us now, we are delighted to welcome back the author, Dominic Pasiga, Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia College, Chicago. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight. Thanks. All right, so we all know that Chicago has been a center of Polish-American sure. life. Why did it become such a focal point of Polish immigration to the well, United you know, States? You know, it was a quickly expanding city, especially right after the Civil War, and uh, the expansion needed labor, and the Poles were just beginning to move. Uh, were actually just being brought into the um, European network of railroads and they came to German ports and ended up in New York and off to here. It became a magnet. Stockyards, steel mills, the tanneries, uh, all the factories along the North Branch uh, eventually spreading out into the suburbs. And how were they greeted as new immigrants into the city? Well, they were unskilled labor. Uh, the ones in the 19th century were unskilled labor and uh, there was a good deal of prejudice against them as there is to most immigrant groups as they begin their tr trek across the American landscape. And I was going to ask you, do, do you sense a similar um, set of uh, language in, in the anti-immigrant uh, movement today as, 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 as the Poles faced when they came here? Sure, of course the media is so different, right? But uh, yeah, there were uh, anti-Polish anti newspapers, there were other kinds of prejudices and eventually European immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe was cut off in the mid-1920s. Uh, after World War I. And explain, you know, uh, Polish assimilation in, in, into American life and life in Chicago. Like you said, they started in these unskilled positions. Mm -hmm. Where did they go from there? Well, it took a long time, but people climbed a ladder. Uh, they bought houses. They saved money. They moved to the suburbs. Uh, many of them, especially after World War II, began to enter into universities, colleges, uh, and move up the ladder. Uh, but there's been several waves of Polish immigration. So these new waves, of course, come in at the bottom again and then work their way up. Uh, it's, it's kind of a fascinating story. We've had a, a relationship, Chicago's had a relationship with Poland that goes back about 150 years. There are still newspapers. I, my family comes from the mountains. They're, we're from Pothala. And uh, there's newspapers uh, in Zakopane that have advertisements for butcher shops and lawyers and real estate firms on Archer Avenue on the southwest side. So Zakopane is, is a place in it's city it, in Poland? It's a city in Poland in the mountains, yeah, close to where my family comes from. Yeah. And, and when did your family migrate They here? came just before World War I, uh, and because uh, World War I was sort of the peak from that part of Poland, which was called Galicia at the time. Now it's called Little Poland or Mała Polska. Uh, and uh, it's um, and so they came basically as unskilled workers in the stockyards. Talk about uh, the divisions uh, among Polish Americans and what it means to 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 be Polish American. I mean, because people have different ideas of what right. their identity is. Well, you know, the pre -part Poland was partitioned in the 18th century, at the end of the 18th century, and uh, uh, large Poland, the Poland before the partitions, was a multi-ethnic state. So Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Jews. Um, uh, Germans, Czechs, Armenians, a large Armenian group, uh, were all part of the Polish crown. So then when you want to resurrect this state, who's a Pole? Mm. And so that idea of who's a Pole, what does it mean to be Polish, was very important both here and in Poland. Even peasants in the 18th century weren't really considered to be Poles. They were sort of the, just the underlings. 
uh, even though they spoke Polish and were Catholic. Now, how did that division play out in Chicago? Well, it broke. It, it, it ended up in a break between uh, various factions in the community. Uh, the Gmina Polska was a group that uh, would eventually go on to help form the Polish National Alliance, the Polish Roman Catholic Union. The Polish Roman Catholic Union said that if you were Polish, you had to be Catholic and speak Polish. The Polish National Alliance said at the time, uh, you're Polish if you believe in res the restoration of the Polish Republic. And so this whole idea was, how do you identify yourself? So many Jews identified themselves as Poles, and they were brought into the Polish National Alliance. You write uh, about uh, some, of, some of the dark side of Polish life sure. in America, organized crime. Mm -hmm. uh, explain a little bit about that. Well, you know, like any immigrant group, uh, there is crime, uh, and there is, uh, because there's poverty. Uh, there was a good deal of poverty in the Polish community, and so there were gangs, there were crime. Uh, Johnny Alberta, uh, handsome Johnny as they called him in back of the yards, uh, was a, uh, a, a booze runner, you know, during Prohibition and, and, a, and a violent uh, fella. He supposedly invented the one-way ride, and then somebody took him on a one-way ride and dropped him off on Roberts Road. Uh, but uh, so there's always been this kind of, you know, when, when groups come in, they're poor, there's poverty. Uh, sometimes the only way out is through, sometimes through criminal activity or through politics, right? Uh, and uh, other kinds of ways, which we see playing out in other ethnic groups as we come along. Uh, so finally, you know, it, 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 but even into the 1950s, there were street gangs in the city uh, that were Polish. And you segued into politics, but that was going to be my next question. Okay. So talk about uh, uh, the Chicago Polish community's rise in local politics. Yeah, well, you know, the first real important uh, Polish politician is, is Peter Kielbasa. Uh, and, uh, and and nothing to do with the sausage, by the way. It's spelled slightly it's spelled different. different. Okay. Different, yeah. So uh, Kielbasa was a uh, interesting character. He was a cavalry officer. He fit this sort of Polish heroic look. He was a very handsome young man. Uh, came as a cavalry officer during the Civil War. Helped to organize the Pol uh, Saint Stanislas Kaska Parish, a noble. Uh, and rose in the political uh, life, first as a Republican, but then turning over to being a Democrat. Uh, and you saw the Polish community was actually divided between Democrats and Republicans, but also socialists and some anarchists, too. So there was, there was a lot of ideological divisions in the community in those days. State Senate's lost Koskos reminds me of another great uh, Polish-American uh, politician from Chicago, Dan Rostenkowski. Lived around the corner, yeah. He lived around the corner, and his uh, his father, of course, uh, was uh, the alderman before he was uh, ro rose in Democratic politics. And so we said at the top um, how Polish life in Chicago influenced uh, uh, Poland. Uh, sure. T tell us about that. Well, you know, my first chapter deals with the World's Fair in Chicago, but it also deals with the Provincial Fair in Lwów, which was then a Polish city. Uh, and that fair was organized in 1894 uh, to... Uh, present Polish culture to the world so that Poland would not be forgotten. Uh, and the Chicago Poles were very active in it. They built a, uh, a house there uh, based on American architecture, Queen Anne style, filled it full of stuff of Polish institutions in the United States. Uh, later on, of course, during World War I, they raised an army of 30, some almost 30,000 men to fight for Poland in Europe, uh, plus hundreds of thousands of Polish Americans and many from Chicago uh, ended up in the American army. So it was a, a it was a a cause for the neighbor uh, for the neighborhoods, but also a cause for just the diaspora as a whole. They were referred to as the Fort Partition, uh, three partitions of mm. Poland. This was the fourth mm. one, the missing brother, who, by the way, could send money, could send bl and spend blood and treasure to help. Uh, so, so they were very Poland. attuned to what was happening back yeah. in Poland. Oh yeah. Uh, it, it, lastly, you write about the rebirth mm -hmm. uh, of Polish life in Chicago. You know, a lot of the neighborhoods that were traditionally Polish, it's the, it's changed, it's sure. evolved. Po uh, Poles have moved to the suburbs. So what's the rebirth you're talking about? Well, uh, there's a rebirth in the suburbs, but there's also a rebirth in Chicago. I mean, there's the Ch Polish Film Festival in Chicago. I was just uh, honored to be vice marshal of the Polish parade last May, and there were some 100,000 people there, and 200,000 people uh, if you took in this, uh, the marchers. And it was just a three-hour parade. I mean, this was a real uh, expression of Polish pride. It's supposedly the largest Polish parade in the world. Hmm. I don't know if that's true, but I think it probably is having stood in the cold on that, <laughs> on that, that uh, uh, dais for a while. Uh, but, uh, it, yeah, I think uh, you, you're now seeing a rebirth, especially of Polish culture. You know, now, now that Poland has become 
in a lot of ways a more normal European country. It's a member of NATO, it's a member of EU, uh, you can go there quite easily. Uh, well, the first time I went it was a communist country right. and it was difficult, uh, I was stopped at the border, they hassled me, they asked if I was CIA. Mm. You know, now of course you just go in like you do in Paris or London or New York. It's just you land, you go through customs real quickly and you move on. Uh, so it's a more normal country. So Polonia or Polish America or Polish Chicago doesn't have to worry about Polish, Poland anymore. They can worry about other things. And, uh, and you see the, the upward movement of Polish Americans. Now, there's also been intermarriage, you know. Uh, there's been uh, assimilation. Uh, I mean, I am a third generation American. Uh, my daughters are fourth generation. Mm -hmm. uh, others have, um, are even, you know, fifth and sixth generation. What does it mean to be Polish? And, you know, I think what happens is when Poland is under stress, when it's under danger from its neighbors, the Soviets, the Germans, whatever, uh, then Poland becomes a very big issue in the Chicago Polish community. All right, well, Dominic Pixiga, it's all in this book. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. And once again, the book is called American Warsaw, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of Polish Chicago. You can read an excerpt on our website. And we're back with more right after this. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Years ago, Chicago was introduced to an Afro-futuristic character seen flying throughout the city in big, bright goggles. Those goggles quickly got national recognition as Chicago artist Hebrew Brantley began creating more characters to accompany Flyboy and his Flyboy universe. Brantley's work has since been featured in numerous exhibitions around the country and has been purchased by musical icons including Beyonce and Jay-Z and even former Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Arts correspondent Angel Edo recently took us to Nevermore Park, an installation the artist describes as interactive and immersive. Here's another look. You can physically live in this space. You know, like you can, you can engage in this space in a way that, you know, if I create a painting, you know, that lives with you, right? And, and it's something that can be transformative to a space, but this is an entire space, right? And, you know, the being able to, to engage, go into things, you know, and that completely changes everything. Welcome to Nevermore Park, home of Flyboy and Little Mama. Chicago artist Hebrew Brantley's new interactive experience introduces the world to the home of his Afrofuturistic characters that have been seen flying all over the city. Brantley says he had to debut his touchable art in the place that first inspired him. You know, everything is uh, a place that's made up and, you know, is in our narrative, is, is a part of our story. You know, it's city of my birth, obviously it's where I come from, and, you know, growing up here, uh, we didn't always get the cool stuff. It, it, it was important. I mean, this is where the ideas started, right? This is where my inspiration really came from. You know, growing up here, my experiences sort of have informed all that, you know, goes into this world, all that goes into these paintings and these creations. So it just, you know, it made logical sense. And I, I knew that, you know, Chicago would support. Tidbits of Chicago's history can be seen sprinkled throughout. Bright neon signs lead you throughout the Pilsen based exhibit. Reruns of Sanford and Son can be seen flashing across TV screens. A Tuskegee Airman's jacket hangs from a chair, paying homage to what Brantley refers to as a flyboy. A newspaper stand sits with everything from bubble gum to sunglasses to issues of Jet and Ebony magazine. An oversized head of Little Mama sits in the center of the floor, with sounds of Aaliyah's one in a million playing as you enter the back of her head. A traditional L train invites attendees to sit for a ride, but should they choose to walk to the back, they'll find a Pullman train car where they can listen to a Victrola. Childhood toys hang from the ceiling of a comfy clubhouse where attendees can try on a pair of goggles seen sported by Brantley's characters. And beyond that sits a cloud room playing a remixed version of Chance the Rapper's Angels, a music video the Chicago artists collaborated on together in 2016. Now, if it feels like you've entered another universe, you have. A flyboy universe, to be exact. Escapism is important to a degree. 
and you know times are tough man like you know i think to have a bit of that you know to remind people like you know it's not always bad or just allowing people to escape you know their situation if not for an hour but you know there's there's i wanted to sort of bottle you know like nostalgia it's it's such a potent you know it's almost like a drug right and people really respond to it i know i do and you know that sense of sort of wonderment while the creation of nevermore park is still what the artist describes as a pinch me moment brantley hopes this flyboy universe encourages the next generation of creatives to push themselves beyond traditional art mediums and just do it when people come through the space and you know get to experience parts of this even if they don't fully understand how it you know connects or what thing what correlates to what the intention is to inspire the intention is to sort of show and put my hand up and say well hey you know i'm here i did a thing i don't profess to have done it right right or the best but i did it for chicago tonight i'm angel ito Nevermore Park, a Flyboys universe, runs through December 29th in Pilsen. There's more information on our website. And that is our show for this Monday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Analysis of witness testimony on day three of the impeachment inquiry. And prominent dance companies come together to pay homage to the legacy of black dance in Chicago. We have a sneak peek of that show. Now for all of us here at Chicago tonight, I'm Phil Ponce, and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Robert Clifford is the honoree of this year's Illinois Bar Foundation's annual fundraising event that raises money to enhance the availability of justice for those without attorneys throughout the state.